Oh, I guess, I guess I'm up. Okay, I'm trying to get the internets to work, as they say, which is a series of tubes, just to let you know. It's a series of tubes. All right, go back. Okay. Can we turn off the, uh, or can we tr dim the light uh, so it just doesn't get all washed out or... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a little bit better, so it's just not yeah. so washed out. Yeah, okay. Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> I tend to, like, get feedback. I tend to look for feedback, body language, stuff like that. You know, anyway. Well, I'm going to try to take you on a journey uh, tonight and talk about uh, how infrastructure impacts design. Um, I've... My career is very strange and odd. Uh, Judy could attest to that. So uh, I'm an accidental designer. Uh, I was originally in the sciences and then found design and the rest is history. Uh, but I have my bachelor's and master's in design. And uh, but since nine, well, since 1985, which dates me quite a bit. Uh, I had I had my first uh, Macintosh uh, and then I never looked back so I, I've been using technology for since then. Uh, now I currently work for IBM Systems which is the hardware software division of IBM. Uh, we just restructured in January and IBM continually restructured. That's what we like to do. So um, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> who is this? Hillary Clinton. Now, why would I show Hillary Clinton on slide one? She's going to be famous. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Because she's local. Tra Trace, Tracy, Tracy is the teacher's pet, so yes. So, so why would that be so important uh, for tonight's conversation? She had her own web server. She had her own server. They're very good. That's right. She had her own infrastructure. You're absolutely correct. And everybody got upset. Because it's like, well, how can a Secretary of State have their own infrastructure? They should be using, you know, the uh, you know, State Department's infrastructure and you know, stuff like that. So you guys are actually getting good grades for civic awareness, which is good. So the journey that I'm going to take you on, I'm going to sort of ease you into it. You know, I don't assume who knows what. And what I love about technology and the Internet is everybody's very brazen, you know, about what they think they know. And some people I talk to, I almost think like they invented the internet, even though they didn't. And I'm more humble because I'm surprised even email works, to be <laughs> honest with you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about infrastructure. And really, infrastructure is the foundation. That's really the most general definition of infrastructure. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to talk about imp digital infrastructure. So we're going to start with infrastructure, which will be very familiar to you. Okay, then we're going to go into digital infrastructure. You know, the, you know, so we're, I'm using the analog and then that. Then um, we talk about infrastructure as a service because that's where everything is going, to the cloud, this thing called the cloud. Then uh, I'm going to talk about abstracting infrastructure. This is where I'm going to get very hippie and Doctor Who on you guys, okay? Because uh, with the explosion of data, we cannot keep up with the data. The data is just growing at such huge capacities that we have to do what I call trickery to actually have that data on existing infrastructure. Because otherwise, we could not build enough data centers in the world. I mean, there's over uh, 500,000 data centers right now in the world. And we just can't keep making data centers. It just, it just isn't going to be possible. So there's all sorts of trickery, which I'm going to talk about, that we do. Then I'm going to talk about one of the biggest culprits of data is not human beings. It's not you and me and our Twitter accounts and our Facebooks and all that. It's really objects that are sending data, you know, 
every second, every three seconds, every however many seconds, whatever, and that's the biggest growth of data. It's not human beings, it's actual like objects. And then I'm gonna talk about the impact on design. But I'll talk about that all the way through as well. And design is the big D, you know, from a planning perspective, and then the other aspect is the actual manifestation of design through media artifacts, whatever, you know, whatever you're into, essentially. Uh, now, speaking of infrastructure, uh, some of you are extroverts. I met an extrovert tonight from Argonne. She said, I am an extrovert, so I believe her. Uh, but if, if, if you're sort of more of a, you know, on the Myers-Briggs scale, you're more of an, of an I, what does I stand for? Introvert. introvert, right. If you're more of an introvert or you're sort of an extrovert introvert, uh, you can actually send me questions. You don't even have to raise your hand. So if you go to goapp.gosoapbox.com and you type in the access code 863-602-893, and I'll just let everybody sort of, if you're, if you're interested, or if you want to do it for what, the, what my friend calls shits and giggles, you know, you, you, you can do that. And then what I'll do is I have my wonderful little memory cube up here, and, you know, I can see your questions in real time, and you can vote on questions. You can say, oh, I wanted to ask that question, and you can say, okay, I'll vote on it, and then, you know, that type of thing. Okay. So, here we go. All right. We're going to start out with the foundation. Okay. So, <laughs> this should look familiar and unfamiliar at the same time, you know. When we think of infrastructure, right, we think of like big honking things. We think of like power plants, right? Or we think of sewers, you know? Or we think of roads, right? Or airports, if I just came from one. Or bridges, you know, that type of stuff. <coughs> So essentially, these are huge, expensive, multi-year investments, right, that help us do things, right? But we don't necessarily think about them. We just sort of use them. You know, we turn on the lights, we, you know, we flush the toilet, we turn on the tap, you know, we sort of, it just sort of happens. And, you know, we don't sit there and think, oh, well, you know, the water comes from here and it goes to the water treatment plant and it comes around. I mean, we just sort of use infrastructure, which is how it should be. So, as I said, infrastructure is a foundation. It's usually unseen. You know, we don't see infrastructure necessarily, you know, but we benefit from it, you know, every single day. I mean, you know, when a hurricane happens and the power goes out, you know about infrastructure because you don't have the power, right? And so, it's essentially a utility as a service. Utilities are a service and they're regulated by the government, right, or by the state because they're for the public good. Right? Everybody benefits from the utility. And we pay back the investments over long periods of time through bonds and things of that nature, right? So that's what infrastructure is. And uh, they're heavily regulated, which makes them an inferior, they're not private, they're sort of quasi private, like NICOR or, or you know, or, or uh, ComEd. Uh, and, and so they have to run like a pseudo business, but you know, the state and the government says, this is what you shall do, this is what you shall not do, and this is how reliable your service has to be, and they have to meet those expectations, you know. Now we're gonna learn tonight that with cloud services that use infrastructure like Dropbox or Flickr or Carbonite, for example, you know, these are privately delivered services. That means the government doesn't regulate those things, right? You know, somebody can sort of say, I'm going to create a service and use infrastructure. And they have what these, they call service level agreements, or SLAs. You'll hear SLAs. And SLAs, guess what, vary from provider to provider. So nobody reads SLAs until it's too late. And then you go, they say, oh, I didn't know that wasn't part of it. You're like, well, because you didn't read, you didn't read the, the, the. Well, they are. Well, yeah, she, the extrovert, so yeah, that's right. They're, they're usually long, but I read them. I actually read them because I, I sort of enjoy it. It's sort of like, oh, that's pretty cool how they got around that, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> you know. 
And, you know, so what is infrastructure? I mean, in the end, you know, what is it? I love this. So if it's structured, the things you don't think about that make the things you do think about possible. It's pretty, it's pretty much as simple as that, you know? Or, well, I abstract it even higher than that. It's the things you need to achieve the things you want. <laughs> That's really what infrastructure, you know, provides. Okay, so that's infrastructure. Are we all cool? Is that pretty cool as a story? I got some thumbs up. I got some shaking heads. Nobody's fallen asleep yet. That's good. It's a little hot in here, a little schwitzy, as they say, but okay, that's cool. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into digital infrastructure, okay? And feel free if anybody has any, you know, bullshit or, you know, whatever, you know, come Jesus moment, whatever, just shout it out, you know, whatever. Okay, so here we go. Hey, what are you doing today? I'm backing up the computer. Photos, work files, you name it. Lovely. Do you want to see what else? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get everything backed up? Took care of it. For just $59.99 a year, Carbonite backs up your irreplaceable files automatically, so you don't have to. Try it for free at Carbonite.com. Yeah, so that's one exemplar, right? It's pretty familiar. We all, a lot of us use storage, you know, backup services. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. And we don't know how it works. We don't. I mean, very rarely do people know. But it happens. And it, you know, that's, it's the magic of infrastructure. Okay, so here's another aspect of infrastructure that's even weirder, okay? If it, it'll fire it off. Enough. Technology gives you security. Technology gives you control. Technology gives you home security and control in a new and revolutionary way. Introducing Plug and Protect from LiveWatch Security, an easy to use wireless security system customized just for your home, controlled from any smartphone, tablet, or computer, and monitored by professionals 24 7. Go to LiveWatch.com to get Plug and Protect interactive security delivered to your door. Arm or disarm your system from anywhere. Lock or unlock your doors. Turn your lights off or on. Even oversee your home with live video. With Plug and Protect, your security system is configured, tested, and then shipped directly to your home. No wires, no installers, just peel and place. Go to LiveWatch.com because with Plug and Protect, we customize your security to fit your home. The Plug and Protect secret is technology. With technology, you buy airline tickets without a travel agent. You trade stocks without a stockbroker. Now, with Plug and Protect, you can protect your home without an installer, pushy salesman, or a long... blah dee blah dee blah dee blah okay? So this is another aspect of infrastructure, right? One was like, you know, I'm going to back up my stuff. You know, where's my stuff? It's somewhere, right? And then this is like, hey, I can monitor my home, right? I can turn the lights on and off. I can control it through my little memory cube here, you know, and I have instant access and I can control things remotely, okay? But I don't think about, well, how does that work? Because what did they say in this commercial? What comes, what comes to your door? It's a box, and it's already configured. So you just sort of hook it up, you just sort of put things in place, and then it turns on, and boom, it works, you know? You don't have to, like, configure, there's no installers, you know, and all that sort of stuff. You just use it. You just, you, you get it right away. It's a little bit of a plane, though. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it should have been a drone. Yeah, right, actually, yeah, that's <laughs> right. So... The internet provides services and, you know, it's supported by infrastructure. It's not a series of tubes, though we do tend to call infrastructure for the internet plumbing, just to let you know. At IBM we call that plumbing, so we use a metaphor, okay? And really what it does, it provides three types of things. Think of infrastructure as three things for the, for the internet. You have compute, okay? That's the brain. You have the network, which is between me and you, and then we have storage, right? So I'm taking all the complexity and all like, you know, all the, the TED talk and all that sort of weird stuff, 
and I'm boiling it down into some very basic concepts. Because when you really get down to it, that's really what the internet is. It's compute, network, and storage. Okay. Now, what happens is there are problems that have to be solved through infrastructure, right? Infrastructure solves a problem, you know, whether it's clean water, electricity. And there are business rules around the problem. And then you have applications that then make calls to the infrastructure in order for you to benefit from it. Okay? So just think of it, you know, in a very basic way. So, for example, you know, your stuff anywhere, Dropbox. You know, that's an example. Or, you know, Apple Pay, you know, through tokens, through tokenization. You know, that's using infrastructure. You know, you just have a near field, you know, near field communications. You tap it, you know, and it goes on whatever card you want. Or TurboTax, you know, even you know these these uh, software as a service, you know, uh, that's that's an example. You know, you're using infrastructure, you're know, using tax infrastructure that then ties into the government infrastructure, so you can file your taxes, you know, online. <coughs> so. Uh, does everybody know what this is? Yeah, it's a server room, a data center, exactly. And you have racks and racks and racks full of these servers, essentially. Um, and they live better than most human beings, essentially. And, uh, you know, what is the anatomy of digital infrastructure? Well, there's networks, right? That's the thing that gets from one place to another. There's data centers, like I talked about. There's servers and virtual machines. There's switches. There's fabrics. Fabrics are a network of switches, you know, that turn on and off. Uh, and storage systems. And all this stuff is what makes the internet work. This is what when so when you when you go to your application on your smartphone, all that stuff is happening in the background, which I'm going to talk about, you know, pretty soon. So you know, this is the mantra: compute, network, storage. Okay, I'm going to really beat it into all of you in a very empathetic way uh, for, for, for a little while. Uh, so compute other resources to handle an ap application computation. You know, the workloads, you know, in an efficient manner. You know, the network is the highway. You know, you know, everybody's, you know, you've, uh, people, have, people have heard of LAN, WAN, and SAN, right? People use it in LAN, you know, hey, what's your SAN? And, and you don't want to ask. And, you know, so you sort of try to, find out what a SAN is, you know, well, that's a storage area network, that's a wide area network, and that's a local area network. These are types of networks that federate, you know, like a government, that federate infrastructure, okay? Because without the network, nothing moves, right? You know, you, you, you need a road to get from point A to point B. And then, you know, storage is really just the capacity of a device to hold and retain data for future retrieval. That's all storage is. Just, it's, you know, I like to simplify things, you know, versus complexify or whatever, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about here. So, so I'm going to give you an example in my life. So I feel vulnerable, but I'm going to let my life hang out here, okay? So this is my computer, okay? And you can see, you know, all my devices and my media and my favorites. There's nothing incriminating. Okay, now. Now we're going to go to the next level. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Now, all right. Now, 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 now we're going to go. Well, now we're going to go the next level down. Okay. So now we're going to go into the bowels. Okay. So these are the things that live on your computer. They they're resident on your computer. Okay. They're on your hard drive. Your applications, your documents, your music, your movies, your pictures, and of course your hard drive, right? That is your computer. It's right in front of you. It's like right here. This this red thing, that's what's on this red thing, okay? Then you have things that are directly connected to your computer. That means they're, they're not in this form factor. They connect through USB or Firewire or Thunderbolt or whatever other protocol you have. So I have two external uh, hard drives. Or tether. Yeah, they're right, tether, right. But they're physically connected. And there's a physical connection, okay? Then there's a third part, which most people don't think about. 
There are things that are networked to your computer. That means they're not physically connected, but you're using a local area network, a wide area network, or a storage, well, you're not using storage area networks, but you're gonna use the first two. So my box sync, my creative cloud, that's all networked through wireless, you know, and I can access it. So to make things really simple, because I, I want to go from like, I want to like get you to the arc of complexity and then bring you back again, is infrastructure is either something on premise, this is a technical term, or physically present with you. It means it's physical. You can see it, touch it, it's here. It's undeniable, sort of. Or off premise, or physically somewhere else. So infrastructure is either here or it's somewhere else. Just think of it that way. It's either on-premise or it's off-premise. And you'll hear the nerd apocalypse, you know, when you talk about the cloud. They talk about on-premise applications and off-premise infrastructure and applications. Well, that just means, hey, it's either physically here or it's somewhere else. See? I'm taking all this consulting, you know, uh, services and bringing it back down. Okay. This is a diagram of the ARPANET network in 1969. This was the first academically connected network. Okay, very simple diagram. There were four nodes, that's it. And uh, essentially, the network was so slow, this is back in the 60s, right? These are like phone lines, you know, copper phone lines, right? That was used for voice. So they were using it for data. And of course, this is when they had punch cards and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So they actually had to break the, the data into packets. And think of packets as like a railroad train. There's the front of the train, there's the back of the train. You get all these cars, right? And each car has data. And so it has to go linearly in a direction. And then the other computer picks up the engine, then the first car, the second car, the third car, the fourth car, whatever, you know, all the way down to the caboose, though there are no more cabooses, and essentially then it then puts the whole data set together, okay? Now that was pretty revolutionary back then, okay? How are we, how are we doing, are we okay? Yeah. Good, I got, I got some thumbs up. <laughs> some people are like, eh, I don't know. What is your, you know. What is your magic box there? Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Okay, now technologies are always in flux. That's the frustrating part of technology is that it's always changing. You know, that's why we have to replace our iPhones like every two days, you know. Essentially, it's, it's bigger, it's faster, it's better, you know, whatever, you know. And so, for example, flash technologies, okay, flash are like essentially storage that has no movable parts, zero. And, you know, your phones have flash technology in it, you know, to hold data, for example. And this is revolutionizing the Internet, flash, because they have smaller form factors. You know, they're, they're not big honking things. You know, they're very small. They work faster. They need less computing power. They have higher storage utilizations than Winchester, you know, they call them spinning disks, you know, with the little needle that goes, you know, type of thing. You need fewer servers then. You don't need as many servers. You know, you can reduce the server footprint. And you don't need as much power because the, the power to run Flash is infinitesimal compared to a Winchester disk, which needs quite a bit of power. And, of course, then there's heat, because right? when you get power, it generates heat. And that's why they put data centers near water, right? Because they have to use water for cooling. And, you know, it gets environmentally questionable, okay? And then the central processing units, the flash, can work faster with very, very little latency. So that means your ability for me to get a message to you, if you're a flash, and then back to me, is a fraction of what a Winchester disk can do. Because Winchester disks have to physically move their needles, and they have to spin. There's all these, it's like acrobatics. Well, flash, there is no acrobatics. It's instantaneous. It literally is almost instantaneous, which means we can create much richer applications for users because our compute is very powerful. Our latency is very low. And so 
I can create very, very rich experiences through applications that I could never do before. Okay, so are we cool? That's the digital infrastructure portion of it. Are we cool? So we got the infrastructure, now we got the digital infrastructure. I got some thumbs up, I got some people sleeping, and I've got, <laughs> no. Okay. All right, now we're gonna go to as a service, because this, you know, every, you know, this as a service, and that as a service. And it's like, what's this as a service, you know? Well, because of mobile technology, you know, these, these things in our pockets. Traditional business systems used to be controlled by IT. You know, these were people that huddled in rooms you never saw, cubicle-villes, Dilbert-villes, you know, and they kept the hamsters going, you know, at all times, okay? And I really respect these IT professionals. I mean, they are ninjas, no doubt about it. But with the explosion of mobile, now, and it's mobile first. Has anyone ever heard of the term mobile first? Yeah, mobile first is, it's like th there's been a paradigm shift or, you know, the tipping point where it used to be you would use your computer first, you know, your, your laptop or your, your desktop machine first, and then mobile would be augmentative. Well, now everybody's, everybody's working on their mobile phones, so it's mobile first, and then that thing is now looking pretty big and archaic, okay? Don't bad about my laptop, okay? All right, so essentially the, the users or the people that manage are going from very highly trained expert IT people. Now they're going to individuals and line of business users. They're the ones that are now configuring and provisioning services. We're all doing it, we just don't think about it, but we're provisioning services. And the IT people aren't even involved. It's not like you have to call an IT person and say, I need to get you know, a seat you know, or a subscription to this. You don't do that anymore. You just spin it up and you spin it down. You, know, you just do it yourself. Now there's a lot of engineering that goes into that, which I'll talk about, okay? So let's not forget the engineers. But essentially, we're moving to simple on-demand access for content and business systems. That's, that's the way it's happening now. All of you in this room are essentially your own IT, all right? So as I said, self-service, line of business users. We're going from closed infrastructure to open infrastructure, you know? We're going to external developer communities. They're the real power brokers now, which I'll talk about. It's not the corporations. IBM is not the monopoly it once was. We have to court developer communities to actually say, hey, we'll extend your solution for you. Because we only have so many developers, right? We only have so much we can do. And so they'll say, oh, we'll create APIs that'll extend, and you know, let's say for the financial services industry or for the entertainment industry, because we don't have time to do that. So they do it. They do it on our behalf, but they do it. And a lot of this is, is changing the way businesses run. The actual business model is changing. Because the cloud does not respect business structure, you know, all the boxes, you know, the president at the top, you know, it doesn't respect that anymore. Now, this isn't just for corporations either, okay? In Africa, Africa is on the cutting edge of mobile technology. You're probably thinking, well, how could Africa be on the cutting edge of mobile technology? I mean, we have all of the iPhones, they have all those little Nokia phones from like 20 years ago, but in Africa, they went from, in 1998, there were fewer than 4 million mobile phones. There's over 500 million now. Okay, there's about a billion people in Africa. Okay, so about half the population. And it's enabling communication. You've got farmers who used to have to have middlemen that they used to go to, to like sell their grain to. And the middleman would say, oh, this is the price of the market. And you couldn't validate it, right, because you were 100 miles from the market. And you had to say either I'm going to accept it or not. Well, now farmers are texting one another saying, this is what he's going to give me for the grain. What are you getting for the grain? And the farmer said, don't, don't sell to him. Come on over to me, and we'll go into town, and we'll sell it to them. And so the information asymmetry, which used to be pervasive in Africa, now you're getting a level playing field. There's even farmers now 
that are controlling their irrigation from their mobile phones, from their very simple Nokia mobile phones. These are touch tone phones. These aren't like smartphones. They're just they're pressing certain things. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. So Africa is sort of making America look pretty like backward actually. All right. Isn't that possible because the city is not doing anything? Right. That's true. That's a very fair point. They they leapfrog they 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 leapfrogged over Essentially, because I used to live in India for a year in the in the in the in the early 90s, and I remember when I used to have to make a phone call, I had to do a trunk call, which means you had to you had a shared phone line, and they would give you a unit of time for me to like make my call. If I missed my unit of time, I had to wait for the next day to make my trunk call. Okay, because you know there wasn't enough phones, so you had to use one phone for a lot of people. Okay, so. Now they just leapfrog over it because it, they don't have to put in the infrastructure. Well, they put in the, the towers for wireless. But I could tell you, in my, my, my neighbors from Tanzania and out in western Tanzania, you know, they have cell towers. They get better reception than we do. They use a lot of satellites. They, they, they do that microwave. Yeah, that's true. You're absolutely correct. Yep. Yeah. So really we're moving to focus, you know, and speed. So you want things simpler, right? You don't want things more complicated, right? You want things simpler because your lives are complicated. So you know what you want to create and you want it ASAP. You want it now. You don't want to wait because we don't like to wait in America, okay? But the engineering to support that simple has become way more complex. I mean, very complicated now. You have uh, virtual private networks, which are called VPNs. You've got storage area networks. You have to federate that infrastructure. And the infrastructure is dynamically moving, which I'm going to talk about. It gets very sort of heady. And virtualization, which is really the cause of all this, which I'm going to talk about, you want to get more from less infrastructure. But the engineering behind it is mind-boggling. Because I sit in rooms full of engineers, and they're talking, they're diagramming you know, how the network is going to access these virtual machines. These virtual machines move around. I mean, I'll decode all of that, okay, in a minute. So essentially, what we have is we have our systems of engagement. This is what you guys use on your phones, okay? Your systems of engagement, your Spotify's, your Dropboxes, your Flickers, your Yelps, your all sorts of things. Okay, those are the systems of engagement, okay? And the emphasis is obviously on engagement, right? And the way you engage is you, you go either through hardwire, like Ethernet, you know, CAP10, or through um, fiber optic, right, which is now, that's the new infrastructure they're putting in, which is much faster, or through wireless, right, through towers. And, of course, there's the wonderful firewalls, right, because you got to make sure, are you really you? I mean, it says you're you, but I don't believe you're you. You know, you better sign in your username, password, right? That's the you know we. Or what's happening now? How are we getting around? How are we getting around that? Because we're very impatient. I mean, how many passwords can we remember, right? So now on apps, how are we signing into our apps now? Through yeah, through Facebook. It says, hey, your Facebook. Press here, and then what it does, it goes and says, hey. I've just verified your you. Okay, now I'm going to take you back to the application because I verified it, and you don't have to you don't have to sign in again. But there's 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 some privacy issues that that happen because then Facebook knows what you're using. See, they benefit from it. Okay, so nothing is free, even if it is free, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, and then you have your systems of record. That's all the back end stuff you could care less about. Those are all the databases. Those are, that's where all the data is stored and pulled from that you benefit from, like on Yelp or whatever. Okay. Okay. Nobody wants to own infrastructure anymore. 
too expensive. You know, we don't. We're, we're, you know, America is downwardly mobile as a society. You know, our wages wages are stagnating. We don't get money anymore. And so people are like, I don't have money to pay for infrastructure, and I don't want to pay for infrastructure because it's going to be obsolete like in two days. Well, yesterday there was a protest. In Jackson. There was a what? There was a protest right right on Jackson. Oh, was there? For increasing the minimum wage. Oh, I I did. Yeah, I read about that. Yeah, so yeah. Timing. There you go. <laughs> so infrastructure is expensive, right? Everybody talked about that at the beginning. You know, it's expensive. And the cost of administering infrastructure has now become two-thirds of an IT budget. It's not the hardware. It's the human capital to administer it. And that constricts investments, right, because you only have so much money. So you hear a lot what they call CapEx and OpEx. That's another thing you'll hear, you know, these Swahili terms, essentially. And all capital expenses are, it's like buying a washing machine or a refrigerator, right? It's like these are big purchases that usually last, you know, six months or more, you know, they're, so that's capital expenses and by the, by the tax code you can then amortize that over time. And then you have OPEX or your operational expenses which are, are your ongoing expenses like to pay for the refrigerator. You know, you're going to pay your electrical, you're going to put food in it, you know, those are variable expenses but you got to pay those, right, in order to use the refrigerator. It's the cost of running a product business or system over time. Well businesses, when they would buy infrastructure, it was on premise. That means there would be rooms full of computers, like in Argonne, you know, and they could go into the room and they could see all the computers sort of you know, blinking away, you know. Well, a lot of them are saying, well, we don't need to own that anymore. We got the cloud, you know, we could just use that. Well, guess what? You freed up your capital expense infrastructure and you've shifted it to your operational expense infrastructure. Okay, we've moved it, and, P and businesses love that because they don't have to own it and then amateurize it over time. They can essentially say, this is like a subscription model. I'm essentially leasing a car. I don't own the car, I'm just leasing it. And then I return it when I'm done, you know, uh, you know after so many you know, months. So when infrastructure is leased back and the costs are shared with users, the cost to access infrastructure is affordable, right? So Spotify, you know, which has a lot of infrastructure, they have millions of users, and they say, hey, for $3.95 a month, you can get your music. You're like, well, I could pay. That's like a cup of coffee, right? I'll do that. So your unit, you're using your little slice of their infrastructure for $4 a month. Okay. That's from sex tape, okay. Uh, so, because everybody's like the cloud, you know, it's sort of like puffy clouds, they just sort of float everywhere, you know. I mean, I've been in very weird conversations about the cloud. But all the cloud means is that it's not in your computer. Remember I talked about on-premise, off-premise? Remember going back to that? Cloud is off-premise, that's all it is. That's all it means, so I'm trying to demystify all this, because you know, everybody likes to complexify it, you know. But it really, oh, it's just not on your computer. So it's living on a data center somewhere, or data centers, plural. And that's where your compute and storage can be scaled up and down depending on the need. That's what they call scale up and scale down, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And then you have public or private networks. That's how you're, remember I talked about, uh, oh, I'm getting to that. I just jumped ahead. Uh, but together, they allow infrastructure to be accessed by individuals and organizations through this, uh, this off-premise infrastructure. Okay? So, you know, your phones, your laptop, your servers, your databases, your desktop, your tablets, they're all accessing the systems of record through digital networks. Remember your wide area networks, your local area networks, your storage area networks? You know, that's, you got, if you don't have that, the internet doesn't work, right? If you don't have a broadband connection or if you don't have any of the wireless connection, your phone essentially just becomes like a, well, I don't know, like a doorstop or something like that. So, you have, there's many different types of clouds, but I'm going to break it down into like just a, I like to simplify. So there's the public cloud, which is rendered over a network, right? Either a wide area network or a local area network. And it's open for the public with different security considerations, right? So depending on who you are, or depending on the type of applications that you use, you know, you could use the public cloud. 
okay? Then there is the private cloud, which is usually with, over what they call a virtual private network, VPNs. And VPNs, you know, I can log in to IBM from here using Judy's infrastructure, you know, her wireless infrastructure, and I jump on it. And then it's coded. I have to put in a code. And then I use her wireless infrastructure, but it's got security all the way around it, so she can't hack into me, she can't see me, okay? So that's what they call a virtual private network. But it's infrastructure operated solely for a single organization over what they would call a local area network usually, if it's wired, you know. Like at Argonne, for example. You, you may have a local area network that's ringed over many different departments type of thing. Well, there's also what they call hybrid cloud. This is the fastest cloud that's growing because it uses both the public and the private together. Okay, so it gets the benefits of the public through the systems of engagement, you know, through your mobile phone. But it also has aspects of the private cloud, like the data actually gets put into your private cloud for security. So you're using the public cloud to access things, but the data goes into the private cloud. So they call that hybrid cloud, okay? So hybrid is the fastest growing cloud. Not public, not private. There are community clouds. I mean, there are several different types of clouds, but hybrid cloud is really where it's at. So what are the attributes of the cloud? Well, it's very simple, actually. And this comes from, uh, from NISTA, uh, the National Standards Organization, which works with Fermi, actually. Uh, not Fermi, uh, Argonne. Okay. Sorry, my slip showed there for a second. Okay, so essentially there are four aspects to the cloud. Ubiquitous access, it's web-based through networks. That's number one, okay, number one. Number two, it's metered, just like a meter on your house. You know, you pay what you use. It's low initial cost, incremental cost as your service grows, tiers of service. It's elastic. That means, depending on how many people are on it, it'll say, okay, we're gonna scale up because there's a million people on it. Well, at 10 p.m., there's only five people on it. It says, okay, we'll scale back down again. So it dynamically scales up and down. And then you have resource pooling, which I'm gonna talk about, which is a very critical part of the cloud. Because we're all sharing infrastructure, right? All of us are. So we got our little bits of, of, of access. So what is that? Compute, network, and storage. See, it goes right back again. It's a very simple story. That's resource pooling. Now, distributive, the, the actual infrastructure stack, we call it a stack, okay, has five parts to it. They call it CAMS, you know. It's cloud, going back to the attributes I talked about, right? You have analytics built in, right from the very start, smarter, predictive types of things. It's mobile, you can access it from anywhere, right? It's social, people to people, you know, the social behavior. And then there's security. Multi-tenant, all multi-tenant means is a number of different people are using it. And we may not even have a relationship with one another. Like you're from Argonne, I'm from IBM, but we're using the same infrastructure. See my point? So it's multi-tenant. So multi-tenant either within the same organization, like one department to another department, like supercomputing and nanotechnology. They're different departments but they're using the same infrastructure. And you have to have security and walls to make sure I don't see you and you don't see me. And then you have access privileges, obviously, based upon that. Yes? Oh, uh, Nate. Like, like, this is Nate. Nate asked a very good question. Well, like, like, what does Siri mean? Well, Siri is sort of pseudo, you know, intelligence, essentially, but through algorithms. It, it is, but I, I, that could be a stretch to me, personally. Okay, that's, that's well, just a stretch to me. Already, well, I mean, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> and remember the cloud is a cloud, right? <laughs> and you know, the reason why we like the cloud now is it offers better insight and visibility into usage, makes collaboration very easy. You know, I can get on, you can get on, we don't have to install Flash, we don't have to install all these drivers, you know, we can just get to work. It supports a variety of business needs, you know. Rapid development, what they call DevOps, which I'm gonna talk about, you know. And, well, that's sort of, that's not very interesting. The results are proven. How can that be number five? 
OK. So the cloud essentially has three layers. See, I'm, I'm getting down to simplicity here, right? You know, everybody's going to complexify it for you, but it's all very simple. Is that you have infrastructure as a service, or IAAS. <laughs> you have platform as a service, or what they call PaaS. And then you have software as a service, which is the most popular, because that's more systems of, of, of engagement, which is called SaaS. So you're going to hear a lot about SaaS. Like, we have to, we have to create a SaaS application. And people are like, well, what's sassy? What, I don't know what's, what is SAS? Well, it's software as a service. So these, these three work together in order to deliver cloud services. Okay. Now, here's an example of infrastructure uh, as a service. So I use Backblaze you know, for my personal stuff. I mean, you may use Carbonite or Dropbox or whatever. Uh, and you're essentially using storage, right? That's infrastructure. So, you know, you have virtual machines and data centers, you know, that's infrastructure, which your stuff goes on. You have raw block storage or file or object storage, different types of storage. You've got firewalls, load balancers, IP addresses, VLANs. <laughs> There's many other types of plans, too. Uh, you know, you could scale up and scale down. So that's infrastructure as a service, okay? Very, very important. What sits on infrastructure? Oh, this is a little. This is a little. <laughs> this is a little plug for for my for this little company called IBM. So most people don't think about backing up their data until they want to recover a file. How many people has that happened to? It's happened no. to me. Come on, come on, <laughs> sinners. Let's get your hands up. Come on. Oh, there's a lot of people here. And and you know I had to pay eighteen hundred dollars one time to get my data back. Because I, I didn't, you know, back it up correctly, you know. So it can be very expensive. So IBM Spectrum, which is a division I used to belong to as of yesterday, um, essentially creates software that allows administrators to protect clients. Clients not as in like business clients, people, but clients are like your laptop, your tablet, your your mobile phone, uh, your database. You know, those are what they call clients. Okay. And um, it's about creating efficient data to, to, to store every piece of data in the most efficient way. And I can tell you from an engineering standpoint, it's mind-boggling how they do it. I don't want to scare you guys. <laughs> so essentially, you know, uh, I have, this, is like, this is like a Candyland. Do you remember Candyland? I used to play that. And this is like Candyland. So what do you want to protect? Well, you want to protect your applications and your systems and your databases and your files, right? That's what you want to protect. Why do you want to protect it? Well, in case something happens, I want to get it back, right? So that's what they call a policy. Policy is a rule, okay? It's a situation. That's, that's, like a, that's what a policy is. Well, how do you protect it? Well, you protect it through IBM services, and it's called TSM Operation Center. Operation Center essentially manages the federated infrastructure for storage. And then you have your archive data, your backup data, you have your migrated data, you have different types of data that you store on servers that have databases. And the database is really like a treasure map. Consider all the databases as a treasure map. It sort of lets you know where everything is, or the system know where everything is. And then you have your storage repositories of solid state, you've got your disk, you get your virtual tape libraries, you've got tape, actual like you know big tape machines that are for long-term storage. And then you access it through networks and storage pools, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Okay. Any questions? How am I doing? Am I freaking people out yet or are we all pretty good so far? Okay, excellent. Good. How you doing, Nate? Okay, cool. <laughs> It is, actually. It is. So we're moving to what they call software-defined storage. You're going to hear this a lot. Software-defined. Software-defined this. Software-defined that. And I'm going to talk about it when we talk about abstracting infrastructure, okay? Because it gets very weird. It gets like very Doctor Who or Alice in Wonderland. So the software is controlling the infrastructure. Not, not, you're not moving knobs on the actual machines anymore. The software is doing it now, okay?
Now, storage has always been a very sleepy business. You know, it was steady state, relatively slow paced up until maybe 10 years ago. You know, a disk was a disk and, you know, it was all pretty, you know, predictable, you know. But now we're seeing a rapid increase in compute storage and network virtualization, which I'm going to talk about. So if you haven't heard of it or you're freaking out, I'm going to explain what virtualization is in a minute. The explosive growth of data, you know, all, all your little machines that talk to one another. Well, that, that data has to get stored somewhere. You know, it doesn't just magically stay in the, you know, it actually has to be structured. Self-service by end users is causing sprawl. You guys are very inefficient. Humans are incredibly inefficient, okay? So we create duplicate copies of things, and then that, ha you know, so you have to back up all the copies, and then you don't know which copy you have to go to. We've all had those situations, let's be honest, okay? We're very inefficient. Line of business users are becoming buyers, and everybody wants Dropbox simplicity. Nobody wants to know all the way it works. That's too scary. You know, it's like going into a haunted house with mirrors and stuff. Nobody wants that. You want to go to Starbucks. And so platform as a service, so that was infrastructure as a service, okay? Platform as a service provides an integrated platform to configure services that you consume. So it's the creation of the software itself, okay? That's the platform, okay? And you can design, develop, test, deploy composable services through the platform, okay? And so you use tools and libraries from from a provider. IBM provides libraries for developers. Apple provides libraries, you know, through what they call software development kits, SDKs, and stuff like that. Uh, and you extend services through APIs, which I'm going to talk about, okay? So this, consider like an API as ability to create like a mashup, essentially. So GitHub is a huge developer community, you know, it's about the platform, you know, and they can. There's all sorts of patterns that they use and modify. IBM Bluemix, uh, shameless here, you know, <laughs> IBM Bluemix. So this, this started uh, a year ago and it's really taken off because developers don't want to get the infrastructure for testing their app. They just want to build their app, you know, and then deploy it. Well, IBM provides the end-to-end -end for the developer. So the developer, all he has to do is develop the app and then he can test it and run it an IBM platform and say, yep, you're good to go. Go go distribute it, go release it. Or no, you got problems. And sometimes they have automation that, that helps fix the app, but other times you have to go into the code and, and try it again. SourceForge is another one. These are all different, you know, developer communities for platforms. Okay, so that's that's uh, platform. So you have infrastructure and the platforms you know use the infrastructure. Okay, so this is like a layered cake type of, type of metaphor. And then most people are familiar with software. You know, they want on-demand applications, do the work anytime, anywhere. And usually the software is consumed through monthly subscriptions, right? We go back to that multi-tenant, you know, I don't want to pay, I mean, I remember I used to pay thousands of dollars for software for a subscription, a seat. And I used to have to install it on-premise on my machine. And then it didn't work, and I'd be, well now, I have, cloud, I have cloud applications. I literally can sign up for it. I can try it, buy it, literally within five, 10 minutes. And then they say, okay, it's, tw it's $12 a month. I'm like, I'll pay 12 bucks a month. You know, that's, that's a deal. Are you saying that you don't have to structure it like Dropbox? Well, yeah, but they have your credit, they have your credit card, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what they like you to believe, but yeah. And so for example, you know, Flickr, you know, Flickr is a software as a service. You've got Spotify, you know, you know, iCloud. You have uh, Skype. Of course, now Skype now has a social. You know, I, I got my Facebook feeds uh, through through Skype through Skype now. So when all is said and done, this is the power of infrastructure. One here. The real question that needs to be asked is what is it that we can do that is impactful? What the cloud enables is computing to empower cancer researchers. It used to take two weeks to sequence and analyze a genome. 
with the Microsoft Cloud, we can analyze 100 per day. Whatever I can do to help compute a cure for cancer, that's what I'd like to do. Compute the cure for cancer. So, what he's essentially saying is, when we used to actually have to solve our compute on premise, you know, within our own infrastructure, we could only do a couple a day or a couple a month because we just didn't have the compute power to do it. Now through the cloud, I could distribute my workloads over thousands of machines, and and I could do a hundred a day, five hundred a day, a thousand a day. I could distribute it. For example, uh, how many people here have Xbox? Have an Xbox? Nobody? One? Microsoft's in trouble. <laughs> Two. Microsoft's really in trouble. By the way, Xbox, you know what they're doing? You can opt in and opt out. If you don't use your Xbox because it has a lot of compute power, Microsoft will buy that on your off hours. And they'll use it for this. So there's all the, you have all these computers in your houses and you don't use it. And they're like, okay, well, when, you, when it's down, we're going to actually borrow your infrastructure, your compute, and we're going to pool all that compute together and we're going to cure cancer. Okay, are we cool? In terms of, you know, as a service, are we, are we pretty cool? I, I got less shaking heads, but that's, that's cool. Yeah. Now we're going to get real hippie. This is about abstracting infrastructure, okay? There's only so much infrastructure. That's the reality. You know what I'm saying? We, we can't build our way out of things. You know, there just isn't enough infrastructure. So you got to say, how do we get the most out of our finite resources? So this is almost like a sustainability issue. I mean, it really is. So, you know, you got your tablets, you got your smartphones, you got your laptops, you got your desktops, you know, and everything is unified, right? Everything talks to everything. You, you do something on the mobile phone, then you go to your laptop. Oh! I did a mobile phone and it shows up on my laptop. Isn't that cool? It's all coordinated. You don't need Google Watch. Well, let's not go to wearables yet. Okay. <laughs> so, DevOps is the new grail. DevOps means how many people here have mobile phones? <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Everybody's mobile phone. And you have apps on the mobile phone, right? Do you ever like get up in the morning and it's like, oh, I got to upgrade my apps today. There's like 22 apps that are saying, hey, upgrade me. And then you upgrade all. It works in the background. And that happens on it. I have, I have about 330 apps on my phone. And, you know, every day I've got 14 to 20 apps that are saying, hey, I fixed this, I fixed that bug, whatever. DevOps is continuous releases. The software used to be, you know, we're going to make the software, then a year later we're releasing. <laughs> And then we'll then release. And then there were fixes. You know, IBM, you know, has this where we have 7.6.1. You know, well, 7 is the version, 6 is the release, and 1 is the fix. You know, they're, 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 you know they, they all mean something. Well, those days are over because, you know, it's like, hey, we don't, we don't, we're just like, we could fix it today. We don't have to wait a year. We can just fix it today and just spit it out. Okay? So applications are instrumented from inception. We love analytics. We, we demand analytics. We want smart experiences, right? Well, it has to be instrumented, okay? There's new types of collaboration. So you have new business outcomes, you know, based on application. Developer communities are the power brokers of the cloud economy. If you can't woo developers to your platform, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. And of course, Microsoft, their, their Nokia, their, you know, their mobile platform, their store is atrophied because developers don't want to develop for a niche mobile phone. Okay, here's my cloud score. It's not real high. Okay, it's only 52.89. And of course, there's probably numbers behind it. You know, so that's, a, that's an example. You know, this, I have a number on my cloud score. And this is really all about what they call Generation D or Generation Digital. You know, smart network systems. This is the world we live in. This is what we expect. And we get really frustrated if there isn't analytics. We really do. Now, there's different types of analytics. There's descriptive analytics, which is the most basic form of analytics. And that's usually historical. You know, it's this point backward. That's, 
descriptive analytics. Well, then the next level of sophistication is what they call predictive analytics, which forecasts what may happen in the future based on what happened in the past. So you're looking at patterns in the past and say, okay, if those things continue, this is what could happen. Okay? And then you have prescriptive analytics, which could show likely results of a series of options. Not just one option, but a series of options. It could say, here are five, vari here are five scenarios. And here's the likelihood of each scenario. But there's a problem with all this analytics. Remember I talked about there's only so much infrastructure? You know, there's only so much. And what did I say are the biggest culprits of data? Is it humans? Who is it? It's your coffee cup that has an RFID that's pinging how hot and cold it is, okay? Now, there's bytes, there's kilobytes, there's megabytes, there's gigabytes, there's terabytes, there's petabytes. Exabyte was the, was the limit at one time. That's all the spoken words ever that were ever spoken on the planet was an exabyte, okay? Well, guess what? We now have zettabytes, yottabytes, frontobytes, geopetabytes. And it's going to get, I mean, there's going to be more. And look at the number of zeros. So you probably think, oh, that's not that many zeros. I mean, it's only, <laughs> it's only, it's only this, but it's only that many zeros. I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> See, humans are the problem. Okay, well, guess what? Every tier is one to a thousand. Just think of, just think of the visualization. There's one, there's a thousand. That's pretty mind blowing. So every, so it's like a thousand of a thousand of a thousand of a thousand. I mean, before you know it, you're drowning in, you just don't have enough server space anymore. Now, APIs are essentially based on REST services. And REST services is a way to efficiently use compute in order to get information from other applications. So it breaks down the calls, you know, I want to make a data call, you can then go to another application and it'll efficiently get that data call very efficiently and fast. That's why APIs are so popular because it, it, it easily allows you to use infrastructure very quickly and, it, and then create that additional data path. You're using somebody else's data and you're putting it into your application. So RESTful services is where things are going in order to extend the value of our applications. So this came from one of my developers. I got an email of developing a little site. I have some thoughts about the site concept. Both Flickr and Google have photo and remote upload apps with APIs available so I can display any account in gallery. From there, I'd use some CSS trickery to display the gallery. Trickery, I like that, CSS trickery. So APIs, you know, we're using APIs to expedite development. We don't have to do it ourselves. We could just do calls in order to, to make our applications more robust. And I'll, the perfect example of that is, guess what? Player discovery so with Spotify and Shazam. So Shazam and Spotify can talk to one another. So if you're in Spotify and you're in a mall, you're like, what's that song? And you go like that. We all do that. I, I love doing that. You know, my wife gets free. She, but you know, I, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's the Stones. And I'm like, I want to play that. Well, I could press that, and, and then it, it handshakes with with, uh, with uh, Spotify and uh, sorry with uh, with uh, Spotify, and I could play the song because I don't buy music anymore. I mean, you know, I'm not going to buy music anymore at all. Now, clouds need to be managed. This is where we get into you know, the bowels. So remember I talked about hybrid cloud? On-premise, off-premise, private, public. You know, it gets very complex, these clouds. And they have to work together in consort. Okay? So individuals don't want to manage infrastructure, right? We don't want to manage it. We just want it to happen magically. Companies want to manage infrastructure but want off-premise flexibility based on shifting demand. So Argon has on-premise infrastructure, but then it says, we're doing an experiment. We don't want to buy additional servers, so we're just going to lease cloud infrastructure to do some of the compute, you know, and we'll pay a pittance 
And then when we're done, it just scales back down. You know, we don't use it anymore. Okay? Companies love that because they have real flexibility. Now, the big players in the space is Amazon Web Services, AWS, Apple, Microsoft through Azure, and IBM. IBM has become a very big player. We're, we're creating data centers all over the world. And part of the reason why we're creating data centers around the world is not just to have more infrastructure. It's about the network and latency. So if I only have one data center and it's in Singapore and I'm in the United States and I'm sending calls through the network, even on a fast network, to Singapore and it has to come back, there's latency. It means you know, there's, there's some sort of like little amount of time that it has to process. And did you ever like do something and the, you get the spinning thing, you get the spinner and it's going around, it's like, what's taking so long? Well, guess what? It's going, hello, Singapore, hello? <laughs> Hello? And then Singapore is going, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can, and then it takes time to get over there. That's what all those spinners are for. So as a service, you can try and buy, you can add additional services, your connection speeds from 50 megabytes per second to 10 gigabytes per second, okay, gigabit, you know, transaction, which is very fast. Now, everything is moving to what I call software-defined environments. Remember, I, it's all about the software, okay? Now, virtual machines, this is where I'm going to get a little hippie with you, okay? But then I have an analogy that'll, that will hopefully save us, okay? It's not perfect, but, you know, it'll work. So, because there's only so much infrastructure, there's only so many servers, there's only so much compute, there's only so much storage, there's only so much network, because network is a resource too, right? Virtual machines can live on any commodity-based hardware and all the functionalities move to the software. So it used to be, I have to buy everything from IBM, or I have to buy everything from Microsoft. Or if I, well, companies don't care anymore. They're like, I have, an, I have a Linux box, I've got a Windows box, I've got all these boxes, and I just wanted to link them all together, and they just all know how to communicate and know how to work, and you know, I don't really have to care about that stuff anymore, okay? Now, you have policies, which are business rules, and what they call policy-based management. You have to manage the infrastructure through what are the business outcomes you're trying to achieve. Well, based on the business outcomes, we gotta have, have the infrastructure deliver that business value. Just think of it very simply, okay? The business value drives the infrastructure, okay? So, virtualization is essentially efficiently using limited infrastructure at all times, okay? Because we can only buy so much infrastructure, okay? And really what you're doing is you're resource pooling. This server is only 71% used. This server is only 42% used. This server is only 5% used. Well, you have a lot of unused infrastructure, right? Why not pool those servers together and when you go to your computer and you click it, you see, oh, I have my hard drive. And you click on the hard drive and you see all your files. Well, guess what? That little icon is a metaphor. It's not sitting in, on a server. It's sitting on many servers. You don't know it because you don't care. You just want to get your files. But your files are in many, many different servers. Okay? And you essentially have a host and a guest. A host allows access to the infrastructure, and guests are the individuals in this room that access from the host. So you can, you can essentially virtualize a desktop, you, you could virtualize software, compute, storage networks, you could virtualize all that. You could take all those unused capacities and pool them together you know, so they work in concert with one another. So for example, that's a server, okay? Well, guess what? We could break up a server into many parts. Each one has its own operating system. You, you see this, but it's really made up of many, many different places. But you see that. So you think, oh, this is great, I got my hard drive. But guess what, your stuff is sitting in seven data centers 
get on 72 different servers. But they map each other. That's why I say the engineering is pretty freaky. They map each other, so you don't, you don't care. You don't care about this. But guess what? They do because they have to make it work. Now, the analogy I'm going to use is we live in a sharing economy now. It's very, it's incredible. We can share things. I have a car. I drive it one day a week. It sits uh, on the curb six days a week. You come to me and say, hey, can I borrow your car? I'm like, okay. Uh, give me 10 bucks. Give me 10 bucks. Okay, you use it for an hour. You come back. You park it, you know. And so this was just in uh, Time Magazine, you know, that now Airbnb, you know, everybody has their infrastructure. And you're like, hey, I don't, I only use it 50% of the time. I want to make money off the rest of the 50%. And people are now very open to it where, where it used to be, no, no, I, you don't touch my stuff. Now it's like, okay, touch my stuff for, for a price. Or even um, or Uber. Uber, yeah. Uber is a great example. Yeah. Or Lyft, you know, all the ride sharing services. Well, with, with politics, it changed that recently where it used to be professional uh, transporter. You could be anyone, a school teacher, whatever. They don't care. As long as you have a car. So we all have futures. So this is where I'm going to make an analogy to virtualization, OK? Because I, I, I like to simplify things, OK? So we have a car. A car would be the resource to handle the need for transportation. So the car is the compute, OK? The network is the highway, right? So it would be the combination of slices of time, right? 24 hours a day or whatever. And then the actual physical roads that you use. So it's time and road. Is that's that's the hot, that's the network, and then storage would be the different parking spaces for flexibility in storing the car. So with 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 uh, lit, oh, sorry with uh, Zipcar, well they were all bought by Hertz. You know they all, they don't even call them that anymore. But you used to be able to pick up your car in one space, but you didn't have to go all the way back to that place to return it. You could say I'm going to return it to the Walgreens down the street, and then I swipe my card, and it knows hey. I'm now here. And then the server goes, oh, your car's over there now. So, you know, the car didn't disappear, it just went to a different parking space. So that's virtualization. It's essentially the efficient use of resources on demand at any point in time. So then you don't need to have, you don't have to keep building infrastructure. You just use the unused portions of infrastructure. That's all virtualization is. But to tie it together, to tie all this together, okay, what do you need? Service. Software services. Thank you very much. <laughs> Zipcar packages it all up. It has the systems of engagement, which ties to the systems of record. And the software is what controls the capacity. It says, we only have five cars today. We got 30 cars today. It's done through the software. The car doesn't know if it's rented or not. The software does. That's software defined. So essentially, you can do more with less. That's what virtualization is. It's, it's not complicated. Well, the engineering is highly complicated. So there's the box again. That's what they call bare metal. You could, you know, if you get nerd, your inner nerd on, they call bare metal. Bare metal is the box. The network, the box starts to recede a little bit, right? Because you can access many boxes through a network, right? It's not just one box, it's many boxes. Virtualization pushes that bare metal even further away. Because it's not just one box to another box, which are whole boxes. You could say, I'm going to turn this box into 30 boxes, right? Because there's all that space on there, OK? And then Internet of Things pushes the box even further away. And then before you know it, there is no box. It's just software defined. Who cares? The software is the intermediary between you and all the infrastructure. You don't have physical anything anymore. And that's what makes it very confusing. So when I hear people, remember the, remember the sex tape? You know, it went up to the cloud. Who knows what the cloud? I don't know what the cloud is. 
People don't know because it's very abstract. You there access it to software. Be, there has to be something. Well, there is. It's off premise. There are treasure maps that know where all the stuff is because virtual machines can move around. You know, they do. They move from machine to machine. They don't. They don't just stay in one place. They, they, around. they move around. But it's through the software. Okay. You know, I log in from one device to another. Did you log into that device? Well, there are concerns around the cloud. Companies are saying, I'm scared of the cloud. You know, I'm scared of all this hybrid stuff. You know, I don't control things anymore. So the strength of the cloud is that it's shared infrastructure, multi-tenant use. But the weakness of the cloud is the same thing. So the strength and the weakness are the same thing. Okay? But there's real complexity in terms of security as well as speed, latency, and reliability of the infrastructure. And so businesses are like, can you guarantee so much uptime? You hear about uptime. You know, Six Sigma, like 99999, you know, I need that because my business relies on the cloud and if it goes down, I have no business. So they call it the plausible unknowns. I hear, at IBM, I hear all these plausible unknowns. Well, if an alligator comes up the toilet, do we have a plan for that? And I'm like, well, what's the odds of that happening? It's like a trillion to one. Yeah, but it can happen. We have gotta have a plan for that. No, I'm serious. We gotta have these plans. What would Enron do? Well, <laughs> they won't they won't tell you, actually. So there's issues around security, there's issues around ownership, there's issues around performance, there's issues around integration. These are real issues. And a lot of businesses talk about the cloud, but they're not using it yet. They're not. They're, they're on premise. They don't want to go to the cloud yet. And remember the service level agreement. You got to read the service level agreement. If you don't read the service level agreement, it is what it is, right? Nobody reads it until it's too late. So this is what they call the this is what they call the Gartner hype cycle. You have a technology trigger, which is the cloud. You get peak of inflated expectations. The cloud will solve all the world's problems. It's magic. You know, everybody's all excited because it's like, this will solve everything. It could compute cancer away. You know, it's all this stuff. Well, guess what happens? What happens when you get that high in expectation? Oh, oh you get the trough of disillusionment. Reality sets in. Oh, that was just a bunch of hype. It's marketing. Everybody gets depressed. You know, this is all just a bunch of bunk. Well, then a few people are like, well, wait a minute. I'm actually getting some benefits out of the cloud. You know, you get what they call the slope of enlightenment, right? You know, hey, this is sort of cool. In very limited ways, it's sort of cool. Not for everything, but for this it is. And then you get what they call the plateau of productivity. You know, you're like, you just deal with it. You know, I got issues around security and all that, but you know what? It's just good enough. It's cheaper. I'm using it. And that's what's happening. Companies, the cloud cannot be denied. It just cannot be denied. Okay. We're on the home stretch here. More than a billion enterprise devices are on the internet. They were going to run out of IP addresses up until a couple of years ago. The guy created the protocol in the 70s or early 80s. And they, th and they created like a real wacky number. Like, we'll never reach it. That's like the plausible, the pl we'll never reach that number. That's like so crazy. Guess what? They ran out of IPs. So then they had to do trickery to create billions of more IPs because all these little devices want to talk. They want to chirp. Okay? So there's going to be trillions of devices talking. So we're designing for an interconnected world, folks. Your devices, your objects, your glasses, you know, your belts, your shoes will all be instrumented, you know, and they're all sending data. So objects are turning into pipes for instructions. We want you know, who wants dumb glasses? You want smart glasses. You know, glasses you can see through. They, that's not enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid some of this stuff. So so essentially, analytics, cloud, social, mobile, right? Cams. Remember we talking about cams before. You got pervasive connectivity, which then generates lots of data. Okay, this is the problem and the opportunity at the same time. Your cup knows you, okay? Your object is a service now. Well, guess what? Has, has everybody ever seen Vessel? Yeah. Vessel is a cup 
and you pour anything in it, it knows what it is right away. It knows whether it's coffee, it knows whether it's orange juice, it knows whether it's fizzy water, it knows it, it, beer, wine, it doesn't matter. It knows. And it's instrumented. And it knows that you, and, and what it'll do is it'll track everything you do with that cup in terms of how much you drink, how many times you tip it. I mean, it's all instrumented. What about Denial of service, yeah, that could, yeah, yeah. The, the top closes. You've had enough. Well, it could manage your weight. It could say, you know what, you drink 64 ounces a day, you know, you're down to 38. You better drink more. It'll tell you. How does it tell you? You have a console. It's the software, right? It can regulate your caffeine. They make you sleep better. I mean, it's ridiculous what they're telling you that you can do. But this is, this, this is not science fiction. This is happening, and this is happening. We expect everything to be smart now. Uh, so IBM talks about a smarter planet. You know, everybody thought, well, that's just a great marketing thing. But that's what's happening. We're getting a smarter planet because that's what everybody wants. So we have smarter education, smarter this, smarter that. Nate, Nate's saying bullshit. <laughs> So we're only going to watch like a couple of seconds of this. More people live in cities than ever before, and for good reason. They are centers of trade, innovation, culture, and opportunity. As such, they are complex entities comprising many different interconnected systems. As more people flock to cities and put pressure on these systems, an important shift is helping cities deal with this challenge, a rise in data. Cities are becoming increasingly instrumented. Sensors that enable the capture of all sorts of data are being integrated across city systems, providing critical information on city activities and operations. Sensors on a bridge transmit data on its physical condition. A camera on a freeway relays traffic flow. And digital meters record water and energy usage in real time. You get where this is going. I don't have to show, that's like a seven minute you know, narrative. But you get where that's going. It's a data explosion. That data has to sit on infrastructure. It has to then be pulled. Your systems of record, which hold the data, has to then feed in your systems of engagement, which are your tools, in order for you to get insight. So this is how it works. There's a guy with these little marionettes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually, it's a puppeteer. And essentially, but there are also a lot of risks to an interconnected world. And we've been talking about like the, what's privacy anymore, you know, with drones and all sorts of stuff. The government now is, you know, they're late and they're saying, hey, we better start to regulate this like a utility because it's not a utility yet, you know, because all these things have their own service level agreements. We better get some, some agreement on how we're collecting and using this data, you know, because we could end up in a very draconian world where you know, you get denied a service, and you're like, well, why? And they're like, oh, we have your data trail on this. And you're like, well, th that's my data. You know, well, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's free and open. Okay, so we call about the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, instrumented objects that send data. The data is based on analytics, right, patterns. Then you actually aggregate that through algorithms and software. You look for patterns. And then you can make decisions, right? Or the system can regulate itself, you know, like in terms of like cities, smarter cities. So we're about done. So what's infrastructure? I mean, <laughs> let's go back. You know, it's almost like coming full circle. What is it? Well, it's the plumbing to create, transmit, and control stored data. If the interconnecting hardware and software support the flow and processing of information. And it's a platform that allows developers to quickly test and create applications. And those turn into services that you use on your smartphones. <laughs> and it really allows organizations to become much more effective without having to own it. You can deliver services very efficiently now. For example, at South by Southwest, PayPal had a contest. They had all these developers in the room, and they said, okay, we have these APIs. We want you to develop an app as quickly as possible. Okay? And we have to demo it. I mean, you know, you have to provision and everything. How long did it take? Okay, we have five minutes. Come on. I'm sorry? 
Okay, with five minutes, we have 30 minutes. You're way off. No? 45 seconds. It was a very limited app. You know, it wasn't like a real robust, but it was an app. 45 seconds using APIs. I'm sorry? <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, okay, well, that, well, guess what? That was your fault. You you filled in the blanks. Okay? Now, why would I show net neutrality? Why would that be important in terms of infrastructure? Or like why why would I even show this slide? Well, can you can you par let's par he, Nate said governance and control. Let's parse that a little bit. Like why why would net neutrality infrastructure, and you're right, Nate, there is an aspect of that, but can we go, can we sort of break that open a little bit? Why would that be an important issue? What, what, what is, what, what, do, what do Comcast and a lot of the big companies, you know, what, sorry? Well, well, we could parse the term monopoly. Essentially what's happening is they want to create different speeds of internet. And then they want to charge a premium. So let's say Netflix says, okay, well, we got to deliver video to your house. And you want it, you don't want to get the spinner, right? You know, you want to get it, you want to get it. It's on demand. Well, then the ISP say, okay, we're, we're going to charge you a premium rate to deliver your service to you. And then Netflix is like, God, that's expensive. And then they go, well, we got to pass on the cost to you. So that's that $4 movie. You know, or your subscription for ten dollars a month. Now it's going to go to twenty-two dollars a month because we can't bear all the cost of the infrastructure. And that's because when they when they when they first when the internet was being thought of by the government, they did not define it as a utility. They didn't. That was like a huge fatal flaw because back then it was too early. They didn't know where it was going, and so what happened was is that if they defined it as a utility, then it would fall under oversight, government oversight. So they didn't do that. And so the big companies are like, we're, no, you're not a utility, and we can charge whatever we want. We can create tiers of service. And other people then, but this was a grassroots movement. It was phenomenal. People just get, said, you know, no, we want one internet, equal playing field. There's not going to be all these tiered services. Everybody can get the same pipe and deliver their services on, on the same pipe. And, they, they did win, net, net neutrality. They actually now it's regulated as a utility. The government, you know, the internet is a right. It's a utility now. Just happened just recently. It was not a utility. So we've come back full around to the physical infrastructure of a utility where there's one service level agreement in terms of the speed, which affects latency, which then affects, you know, your quality. So infrastructure does, you know, hopefully you're making connections to design because Infrastructure does affect the user experience. It affects the snappiness of your application. It affects the data through the APIs that you can pull and push. But designers don't really understand infrastructure because they're like, well, that's what engineers do. They'll figure it out. I'll just sort of give the big idea, and you guys figure out how to do it. Well, you, you can't do that. So I'm on a project. I have to know the limits of the infrastructure in order for me to define the service. So a way to think of it, IDEO came up with this, so I didn't invent it, is we tend to focus on the human to computer interaction. That's the fun part. You know, you got your tablets, you got your phones, everybody's having fun, we're all happy, you know, we're consuming our systems of engagement. Well, guess what? That's supported by computer to computer interactions. You know, you, without that, you can't get uh, human to computer interaction. And then in the end, it supports human to human interactions. So, you know, in the end, we're a bunch of humans that are trying to work together through human to computer interactions, which is then supported through computer to computer interactions. So I, I like to simplify things. So that means we have to think about the six experiences. This is IBM. We have what they call, we have an actual life cycle for our software now. Try, discover, and buy. Getting started. Productive use. Manage and upgrade. Leverage and extend through APIs. These are life cycles. And the user experience has to address the life cycle of how people are going to consume their systems of record, their systems of engagement, 
and then the systems of record support it. So I like airplanes. I, I, I don't, I'm not a pilot, but I do fly. You're probably wondering how I do that. But anyway, <laughs> so you know, this is the old metaphor. These are steam gauges, and each gauge controls one aspect of the aeronautics. And that's why it took a long time to be a pilot, because <laughs> you, you have to know what all this stuff means, and you have to infer interconnections. Well, guess what happened? These are now the new flight systems. They are totally integrated and instrumented where pilots don't even fly planes anymore. When pilots take off, they do take off. But literally, the minute they take off, it's, it's auto until they land. You may not know, but that's what happened. And now they're saying, well, people can control airplanes through their mobile phones, through wireless. You know, they're, you know, have you heard about that? And that's the alligator that comes up through the toilet. That's the plausible unknown. Somebody's going to crash an airplane. So better infrastructure integration assists, assists consumability. Designers need to collaborate with developers and engineers to look at the infrastructure data model, automation. And these are some questions you should consider when you're designing. What's the authentication model? How do you authenticate that you're you? What's the session time? How long is the session time You know, before you get logged out, for example? What's the data model for specific software workspaces? What APIs may be needed to get data from one application to feed into your solution? Because you may say, we'll just borrow this, you know, we'll just we'll borrow it. What role will descriptive, predictive, and or prescriptive analytics play in automating content in terms of features and functions? So you don't even have to touch it, it just does it. What level of expectation does the user have toward automation versus manual workflows? This is a big issue. Automation, you know, like, well, I want control. I don't want it fully automated. Well, you have to have overrides, right? Based on user. How are alerts and errors communicated to the user? What's dismissible and non dismissible in terms of errors? Search, is it going to be reduced to crawling or are you going to actually have more robust search? What level of automation can happen in the back end to hide a lot of the processes like Dropbox? You know, all that stuff's hidden from you because you don't care. You just want to, like, upload and download. Well, guess what? The engineering behind it has to make that happen. What is the latency of the data? And, and so I collaborate a lot with technical people. And they actually act like designers now. It's great. That's it. I'm done. And I, well, yeah, Judy was like... Is this guy? I mean, it's like 10 p.m. already. <laughs> I really want to see if you got any questions, too. Well, you know, nobody, did no anybody submit any? Because I, I, I kept looking, and I didn't see any. I got big, fat zeros. Aww. You know, I tried to connect, but I couldn't. Okay. Uh, All right. All right. Infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, well, let me ask you a question. You. Infrastructure. <laughs> Uh, was this understand? I mean, yeah, was, was it understandable? Yeah, or? yeah I thought you simplified it really well. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so you have a little more confidence. So when you meet consultants and they talk about PASS and the SAS and the SAN and the LAN and the LAN, I mean, you're like, hey, I know what that means, right? You can't hoodwink me. But you have a greater appreciation of infrastructure and how it affects your life and how you use it. See, I'm telegraphing, I'm seeding the crowd. Yeah. I'm seeding well, the crowd I, right? I would think that we have an appreciation for infrastructure just by waking up and walking and just observing the world. I mean, especially for people who live in the city. Mm -hmm. like, you know, like we're, we're, like we're in this building above the ground. We took this thing from an elevator. I mean, it's... Yeah, we don't think about it. We just, it's, it's just it's, sort it's, of given. It's easily taken for granted. Yeah. For example, the city of Chicago... They actually have a chief information officer, which shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody here. And they actually are doing some very interesting stuff because they're essentially saying a city is data. That's all it is, just a series of data points. So now what they do is they're creating a data standard for all the city departments. They actually post the data in this accepted format. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is. That's true. You guys are involved. You guys are involved with everything. So my point is, is that now you have developers who are downloading data sets from, from the city website and they're creating their own apps from the data. Okay? So that's pretty cool, you know? Yes? So um, thank you. That was, that was awesome. Oh, good. Uh, thank you.
Thank you for demystifying. So load it down in the structure. So I accept Visa, MasterCard, and <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Well, I wasn't the author of that policy. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Uh, not. Uh, so, you know, this is great. I, I like the kind of the grand, you know, vision of yeah. all this, which is, which is good yeah. as human beings in terms of progression. Mm -hmm. But I know there's a but coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's always a but. Yeah. Right. Um, But, you know, tied to that is, you know, I, of course, I, through your talk, your narrative, I was thinking about this more is, um, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if, it, if one calls it an ethical dilemma or a conundrum of sorts, but, you know, I'm so reliant on these tools. Yes. Right? Yeah. We all are. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your, you know, your beaming Mac here. Yeah. And red and, but, you know, when I see the red, I'm thinking about, you know, the, Come on, come on, get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. The people in China. Yes. That, hey, I give you an hour and a half. Come on. Maybe. All right, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You know, think about people in China that you know committing suicide and you know these machines. And so, any thoughts on like the ethical dimension of all this? Like, so this is the information landscape. What is what is the moral slash ethical landscape of all? Well, this? I would say that our morals haven't caught up with our infrastructure. If you really want me to get straight about it. You know, we, we are, we're consumers of technology, and we don't think about the ramifications of the resources and the power and the inequities, you know, the people are making the stuff in the Gobi Desert, so, you know, we don't care. You know, we just want the plane loads to get over here so we can, you know, use it. So there are some huge dimensions. But I would say that virtualization is actually a great blessing because we've really realized we cannot... We cannot build our way out of this thing. We have to use we have to use our limited resources, like water is a limited resource, or we have to use it as efficiently as possible. So infrastructure, they're, they're actually creating some incredible ways. That's okay. They're, they're creating some incredible ways where we could slow down the amount of data centers, which then you know use tons of more energy, and we have to build more servers and more concrete and you know, all the things you have to do to build. You know, we can slow that, we can get that curve, that cost curve down and use every bit of infrastructure, you know, as efficiently as possible. And I think that's good. But it does raise a lot of issues, like even around what is it to have privacy because we want all the convenience of automation, right? You know, that I want to be able to not have to log in, it just knows who I am. Well, guess what? You know, for example, Snapchat or the Snapchat application, which then, you know, it, it, it keeps the image and then it goes away. That's the whole thing about Snapchat. You know, just, you only saw the image for a couple of seconds, it would go away. Well, some developer created an API, because some people said, well, I want to actually, I want to subvert the value and I actually want to keep the image. Well, he said, okay, I created an API for it. Everybody's like, oh, this is great. Now I can actually see my images and all that. They don't just poof. Well, guess what? There was a back door. And then all those entertainers who took nude images of themselves, they, somebody hacked in and put all this on the internet. And people were like, oh, this is horrible. Well, the developer who created it, he didn't think, oh, there's a back door, but he created a back door, and guess what? That happened. So, the, you know, the, there are no sure bets to any of this stuff, but we're willing to do it because we get more benefit than the downside. But there is no easy answer. Like, for example, right. I, uh, my iPhone, I'm like, I'm not going to keep upgrading my iPhone, you know, every year, even though I want to, because I could use it for three or four years and, and then reduce some of this stuff. You know, I think we have to, we start to, we have to become uh, more educated consumers and make smarter decisions. But if we share things, like share cars, share homes, share this, share that, then we, we reduce the pressure to like keep making stuff. I have a, an insight because I keep thinking about this because this has enabled the sharing economy. Like, yeah, we talk about you're about right. It. You're absolutely right. People are going to start stop buying. People are going to start buying just what they need. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm an artist. I've stopped making gigantic paintings. Why? Because people move around. They sure. want to take the painting with right. them and put it in their car. There you they, go. You know, we live in a different way, and it's yes. enabled and, and um, brought, yeah. brought it outside. Yeah. That's a, that's a good use case right there. So yeah. you just buy what you need, and then you walk away. Yeah, it's called just-in-time. Yeah. You know, it's all just, we all want just-in-time. But I can tell you, just-in-time is tricky you know, to get that to work. But yeah, we want to live in a just-in-time world, and that means we don't we don't have to like hoard stuff. Yeah. You know, we use it. And I'm, my dad is getting married. I'm going to rent Congratulations. the dress. I'm going to rent the dress because I'm going to wear it once. No, you don't I rent the dress. You say yes to the dress. I want, <laughs> a really nice dress. I want a really nice dress, but I don't, you know, I right. don't want to keep it. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Congratulations. Right. Other questions, comments, fears, hopes? Yes. I just want to say that uh, just this last weekend, I decided to start a company that was going to rent dresses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to hook you. We're going to hook you up. See, Judy, you bring people together. I love it. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Well, I think there's also like a great education, which I don't, I don't see a lot done, is like one's own personal data and how that is a part of this infrastructure. Like, to what extent should be a part of the infrastructure? Like, for example, maybe, maybe, maybe there's people here who were advised by their lawyer to say, you know what? You know, you're making a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And that's going to last longer than you, like your mortality. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that factor in? Well, for uh, example, I, I remember, mean, I, mean, I, I, I remember when Schmidt, when, when, when Eric Schmidt from Google, you know, he was like, you know, what are, you know, people, you know, teenagers, you know, they're putting all the stuff on Facebook, and then you know, they go for a job, and somebody says, oh, I saw a beer bottle, and you were, you know, bong, and you know, you're totally, you know, totally unreliable, and Eric Schmidt said. Oh, at Google, we were, we were talking about it. We're thinking that at 18, you can walk away from all of your digital data and start all over again. And what on the news feed? Eric Schmidt said at 18, you could wipe away your whole digital footprint and you could reset it to zero. Now, he was joking. He said, no, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what people? He was like, oh, and they're like, oh, that's great. Because people want the magic pill, you know? Like, oh, I could just reset, reset my history. But, you know, that's not the way it works. So there are some real issues. I think you're right, Nate. And, but of course, we want free. We want free. When my daughters were small little kids, they'd run to Liz or me and they'd say, it's free, I want it. And I'd say, well, let's go take a look at it. And there would be like an asterisk next to free. And there'd be all this little type underneath it. And I'm like, that's not free. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do this. Then it's free. But it's not really free. So it's buyer beware. But the problem is we want free. We don't want to pay for anything. Well, if you don't want to pay for anything, then you're playing on somebody else's turf, and they're going to say, here's the service level agreement. You know, and you're like, okay, fine, click. And they're like, well, wait a minute. That's not what I want. You know, the privacy settings. They're like, well, we own your data. No, you don't. Yeah, we do. Look at the service level agreement. We own your data. Yeah. Anybody concerned about security? Well, people don't, people don't think about it, but yeah, security is a big, but security is a moving target. These are all moving targets. You know, what we, what we, what we defined security a year ago is different than it is now, especially as we get more interconnected. But I think we're doing, a, uh, through algorithms, through, through automation, we're actually getting pretty good at security, much better, because one of the things we have to move away from is the username password. You know, we're, st we're, we're still using 40 years of technology, we got to come up, and that's why tokenization, you know, the whole Apple Pay is great because tokenization abstracts the handshake between you and your credit card information. It's just done through a token. Yeah, but you have to keep doing it over a Yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't go into it. But essentially, it, 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 you don't have to feed any information, it just sort of creates a handshake between the tokens. And well, then it says you're good. I mean, that's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I security, but thank you for bringing it up. But you know, there's one infrastructure that is just ahead of any infrastructure. That's the criminal infrastructure. So they're they're innovating ways to bypass. Oh, of course they are. It's a never-ending game of cat and mouse. But you know what? That's just the way humans are incredibly inventive, either for good or for bad. I mean, and that's just the way it always will be. But the good thing is, you know, I think things are. I mean, IBM, we have huge divisions that just deal with these issues, 
around, around security and around integrity of platforms and stuff like that. But you have to be ever vigilant. Any other questions or comments? I think everybody's ready to go. Get some beer. <laughs> Not virtual beer, but real beer. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.